activist, being the skipper of the Rainbow Warrior would be a defining moment of a lifetime. Our guest, Pete Wilcox, has spoken many times of the bombing 30 years ago and the relationship he has continued to have with the two ships that followed. But what is known about the campaign he was on in the weeks before the ship's arrival at Auckland? So what was the aim of your campaign in Rongelap all those years ago? Well, 1985 was the year we had intended to spend protesting nuclear testing in the Pacific. Our first campaign was up in the U.S. Marshall Islands, or the, excuse me, the Marshall Islands, where the U.S. had used a group of islanders as guinea pigs to measure the results of radioactive fallout, and they intentionally exposed, quite deliberately, uh, the people of Rongelap Atoll. Uh, after 30 years of increasingly more difficult health things, women that had multiple, multiple miscarriages, jellyfish babies, they asked their government to move them, that they didn't trust being there anymore. And their government said, no, you don't need to. They appealed to the U.S. government, who, because of the agreement after World War II, had given the U.S. pretty much complete autonomy to do whatever it wanted in the Marshalls. The U.S. government said no. So a few years later, when Greenpeace announced that we were bringing a boat, they said, we said, what can we do? And they said, please, get us off this island. Our children are dying. All of the people who were exposed to the fallout in 1955 have developed thyroid cancer. I mean, the health problems just go on and on. So we moved them, and it was really dramatic for most of us, uh, considered it really the high points of our Greenpeace career to do something so fundamentally useful as get people to a safe place to live. From there, we came down to New Zealand to prepare for the trip out to French Polynesia, where the French were also testing nuclear weapons. What happened, of course, was that the French government was significantly threatened enough by a bunch of hippies on an old steel boat that they sent a military team to put bombs on the boat, and we were blown up in Auckland Harbor on July 11, 1985. In the process, our photographer, Fernando Pereira, was killed. The New Zealand agents were caught red-handed two days later uh, trying to get out of the country. So it was kind of a big story at the time. So how did the Rongelap mission affect you and your crew's lives? It, it pulled us together as a group. I mean, we had all been together on the boat for about six months, and the, the first four months we had spent in Jacksonville, Florida, putting a sailing rig on the boat, which was a lot of work. And this was in the days when, in Greenpeace, we did all the work ourselves. And now it's, we don't have the time. But then we did all the work ourselves. And we were all so dwarfed and impressed and pulled together by what we were doing in Ronglap. I mean, as an American, I was so affected by learning that my government had done this. And we all know governments make mistakes. They're just people. But there are some brilliant ones out there. And what they did was really dastardly, absolutely criminal. And to be able to help in that situation was gratifying. It, it felt wonderful. And it was, uh, it was quite an event. 30 years on, what do you think of New Zealand's preoccupation of French spies and neglect of Rongelap? I'm not sure I understand your question. I mean, I'm lucky enough to get to New Zealand about every 10 years. So what, if you guys are worried about French spies, that's your problem. Uh, Rongel app is something that will stay with me for the rest of my life. It won't change. Um, I was hoping to get the boat back there this year. didn't happen. Uh, I'm really um, encouraged by the Marshallese lawsuit to the World Court of Justice to sue the nuclear powers for not getting rid of their weapons when they promised to. And I, I hope that that case gains traction and, and goes ahead. Uh, Ron Glapp will stay with me forever. It was, it, was just, it was amazing. How are the relations between the French government and Greenpeace today? Oh, I'm sure they're better. I mean, remember, I've, I've never held the French people responsible for what their government did. As an American, I wouldn't want to be held responsible for what my government has done at times. The people I hold responsible are those members of government that made the decisions and the soldiers that carried it out. Uh, Justice was never done in the murder of Fernando Pereira. Uh, his murder tore a hole in the lives of his children that has yet to heal. Uh, 
so France, well, but we, you know, we have to move on, and that's what we're doing now. I mean, our our call to France now is to kindly respect the efforts that civil society is putting into the negotiations at climate change, the groups like Greenpeace and all the others, the private people, who are taking quite strong stands uh, about global warming. The COP21 is coming up in France later this year. And we want the French government to be aware that many of us on the planet are taking strong stands, and it would be nice if they respected that. So how much of a problem is climate change in the world today? A quarter million people are dying every year from it. Uh, it's enough of a problem so that India has built a massive barbed wire fence between it and Bangladesh so that when the lowlands of Bangladesh flood and the millions of people are trying to escape to save their lives, they won't get into India. Uh, there's a huge drought going on in, Ca in California. Uh, I mentioned a quarter million people a year. That's a, a casual estimate. Uh, it's, all effect it's affecting us now all, and it's going to get worse. I mean, I have two children ages 20 and 24. And I know this global warming problem is something that's going to confront them for the rest of their lives. Uh, there's going to be no winning it. But if we work really hard now, we can try to mitigate the damage that it's going to cause. So, I mean, get ready. It's, it's here. So President Tong of Kiribati said in a CNN interview the other day that it was already too late for his country over climate change. What is your response to that? I think he's probably right. And I think it's unfortunate. And I think it's another wake-up call to the world. I mean, we still have all the oil companies and fossil fuel companies want to do business as normal. Scientists tell us now that if we burn one quarter of the amount of fossil fuels that we have in hand now, we're going to push global warming up past the two degrees Celsius margin. Mind you, climate scientists like James Hansen, formerly of NASA in the United States, feel that a two degree rise in global warming in temperatures is a disaster. I mean, look what was happening already. The climate, the temperatures have gone up 0.8 degrees Celsius. A quarter million people are dying every year. The big one hasn't really come yet. That's going to be the flooding of Bangladesh, sinking of the Pacific Islands. It's, it's here, and, it's, and we're going to have to be dealing with it. So I'm afraid the president is correct. It, um, the problem is, if we stop burning fossil fuels tomorrow, because of the lag time, the physics, scientists tell us that uh, the temperature is going to rise another 0.8 degrees, even if we stop burning tomorrow. And we haven't even slowed down. We've barely started slowing down. We've got to make much better efforts. I mean, in my country, it's so incredibly embarrassing that we're just putting up our first offshore wind farm. It's going to have five windmills. It's nothing. It's, we're not dealing with the problem as serious people. In my country, politicians have been bought off by corporations now. Politicians have to run. They get funds. Eighty percent of their funds come from large corporations and, private, and a few private citizens. So that means us private citizens, they're not a concern. Politicians don't answer to us, and they won't as long as, as we have this stupid system. So we've got to change some very fundamental things about the way we're doing business on the planet. So what do you say to your children? Like, What do you suggest we do about this? Good luck. Um, well, I I'm lucky my, my older daughter is uh, studying sustainable development in a master's program in Belgium. My younger daughter is going to be a marine biologist. She's in college. They know what they're facing. I mean, that's... Um, Balancing my Greenpeace career with being a parent has been difficult. I've been gone a lot, but um, they realize what's, they realize what they're looking at. They know full well. I would really like for them to feel confident enough about their future for them to have children in five or ten years. And I, I don't think they're there right now. They can see what's going to happen. You were arrested by the Russian military in the Arctic 30 campaign. Did you think about retiring after that? Yeah. <laughs> that was a little over the top. But no, I, I'm, not, I can't, I'm not even close to retiring. Um, I started working for environmental groups 44 years ago or something like that. And I thought, this will be fun for five or ten years, and then I'll get an adult job, and I'll, I'll settle down. I'll be a real person. And 
in those 40 odd years, the world has done nothing but gotten worse and worse and worse shape. And I feel like there's no way I can stop now. I mean, I've, uh, for young people today, a message I would like to get across is that participating in civil society, participating in something outside their own immediate concern is going to give them a fundamentally better life. And I know David Roby would say this, it's something I felt. Getting involved with what's going on around you makes you a happier person. They've done sociological studies and um, people that participate in demonstrations and actions to a moderate level feel better about the planet they live on. So get involved. And you're going to have to deal with it anyway. Uh, there's two ways of looking at it. You're either going to be sitting at the table or you'll be part of the meal. And I suggest that for the rest of your lives you'd rather be at the table than getting eaten. So get involved. I've had a great life. I'm still having a great life. I'm not about to quit. Um, it's added to my life. I think I've been a happier person because of my involvement with Greenpeace and I'm grateful to Greenpeace for giving me, I like to sail, I like, to, I like the work I'm doing and it, it's doubly good because we're involved with something that I think is important. And you're heading off to Great Barrier, what are you going to be doing there? Well there's a proposal to double the coal exports from Australia. It's a really stupid idea. Remember what I told you, we already have four times the fossil fuels in hand that we can burn before we just burn the whole planet up. And the, the coal companies in Australia are a huge industry. They just want to make more money. But that's not cutting it anymore. That's not helping you out. It's not going to help me out. It's not going to help anybody out. Now, the, the actual proposal, like at Abbott Point, where they want to dredge it out, they want to dump the spoils inside the reef. That's going to be a problem. The reef is already getting pounded by the agriculture industry and all their fertilizers and runoffs. The reef, the outer part of the reef is doing okay, but Australian uh, coral scientists told us two years ago when we were there that at the rate the acidity of the oceans is increasing. And remember, the more fossil fuels we burn, the more CO2 we put in the atmosphere, the ocean absorbs around 40% of it. When the ocean absorbs CO2, it becomes carbonic acid, so the oceans are becoming too acidic. The scientists have suggested, have suggested that within 20 years, the oceans are going to be too acidic for the, the uh, calcium-based shells to form of the plankton and the coral. And now we're changing the fundamental chemistry of the ocean. Are we going to kill our oceans? I don't want to. But that's serious. I mean, we're not talking about a problem that's going to be bothering your grandchildren. We're talking about a problem that's bothering all of us now, and it's going to be with you for the rest of your life, and me for the rest of my life. So we have to do the best we can to, to change the way we're living on the planet.